First Kings 17 and 18. All right, we'll be there in just a minute. I started a few weeks ago uh, with a series on Elijah, and we are in the uh, third week of that prophet of fire, man of despair. Uh, and our, our theme was James 5, uh, 16. It says, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. We've all heard that passage before. But then he's given an illustration or an example of that. He said, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain. So over the past several weeks, we've, uh, in in the series, and if you missed it, it's on our YouTube page, our podcast on iTunes, our Facebook page, you can catch up. But we looked at a quick spiritual history of the the spiritual life uh, at the beginning of 1 Kings, what life was like, the divided kingdom when when Elijah surfaced in this story. Uh, We saw where Elijah went to Ahab and uh, announced that there was going to be a great drought. It's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. And then immediately, God sends Elijah to a brook in Gilead. He said, you just, you go and you just wait by this brook. Even though it's a drought, you know, uh, I'm going I'm to provide for you. I'm going to send ravens with food in the morning and at night. And, and Elijah did that and it worked for a season. And then all of a sudden the brook dried up. And then God sent, or Elijah is sent to a widow in Zarephath. Uh, We talked about that uh, uh, last week. He was sent to a widow, and this widow uh, used just a little bit of oil that she had in her barrel to provide for Elijah and and her son, and it was a miracle. Now, later on, God is providing for them, and then all of a sudden, the widow's son gets sick and dies. And I really didn't get to finish last week, so I'm just kind of finishing up. Uh, last week in order to get into uh, this week's. And, the, and, and when the son dies, man, the widow, she just lets Elijah have it. Who are you, man of God? What, what did you come here to bring judgment on me for my sin? I mean, when the boy died, she just let Elijah have it really, really quick. And then we saw the end of the story where Elijah takes the boy takes him up in his room, stretches him out on the bed and prays over him or whatever he does. And the first time it wasn't successful. And the second time it wasn't successful. But the third time, man, God brought a resurrection, which he had never done in the, in the, in the history of Scripture. That had never been done before. And that was just our encouragement last week, just to keep praying, keep believing. Don't give up in, in pursuit of your miracle. Well, uh, I, I just, I, uh, First Kings 17 and 22, I want to read this passage, but I want to just mention something really quick. It says, the Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. All right, so let me just stop. Let's just back up just a few hours or maybe a day before when she is holding the dead body of her son and she's letting Elijah have it. What are you? You say you're a man of God? Really? All right, didn't you just come to bring judgment on me. Now, can I just remind you, when when she says that, can I just remind you of what had occurred previously that this little widow, that we don't know her name, we, we just know she was a poor widow who was living in Sidon, and the Lord brought a prophet from Israel 100 miles over to Sidon, which was the capital of, of all things Baal worship. And it was probably very spiritually dangerous for Elijah to be residing in here. If you remember Jezebel, Ahab's wife, man, her family was all over, you know, the, the ruling class of Sidon and, and Baal worship. And God brings this prophet over uh, for uh 
uh, for this season. And because this prophet is there, God is providing for her. She's getting a daily miracle, a daily miracle with the oil and the flour that will just never, never dry up. She's getting a daily miracle there. And God has also brought this prophet over and positioned this prophet, Elijah, so that when the sun dies, he is there. All right? So all of this, and then all that God is doing, and then in the moment that it didn't work out, man, she turns the finger and starts to blame him. All right? Can I just say something to you this morning? Be very careful when you complain about your life. You may feel terrible when you see his plan work out. I mean, she was living with a daily miracle. The prophet coming, the oil and the, and the flour was not, was, they were never running out of that. And then, man, all of a sudden something doesn't work out and she points her finger at Elijah and she points her finger back to God. So I just want to say, be thankful be thankful knowing that God's hand is at work in our life. She's pointing a, a, an accusatory finger in the presence of living in a miracle every day. Why is this prophet here? It was the hand of, it was the, the hand of God. And I just want to say, sometimes we don't see the hand of God at work in our life. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but he doesn't always check in with me about what's going on in my life. He doesn't always inform me. So before I grumble and complain and point my finger to God, I just need to be thankful for the miracle that I have right now and just believe that God's hands at work in my life even though I can't see it. She was pointing a harsh finger in the presence of of the miracle the Lord had done all of this, brought this prophet right, right here for this moment. And she couldn't see it. So let's just be thankful for the miracle that we have and for what God's doing in our life. Can we just do that this morning? Can we just take a moment and just give God thanks? Can we do that? Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for the hand that we see. And we thank you for the unseen hand that's at work in our life. Even when you don't understand. Even when we don't comprehend. Lord, forgive us that we've grumbled and that we've griped and that we've complained. Because, Lord, we did not understand your hand and your work. Lord, we just give you thanks today that you are ever at work in the hearts and the lives of the people this morning. One more time, give them a shout of praise today. He's at work in our life. She was letting God have it, but she was on the brink of a miracle. Hey, you know, she, she needs to be thankful he's not a vengeful God. Or she could have been going to a funeral that afternoon. You know, she, he, 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 he could have had judgment, but he, but he didn't do that. So, but here, here's the prophet too. Here's Elijah. And, and let's, let's look at this for a second. <clears throat> Sometimes God's plan and the hardships that I face are not about me. It is about reaching others. So he brought him. He brought him from Samaria in Israel. Brought him to Sidon, the capital of all Baal worship under the, you know, under the uh, uh, influence of Jezebel's, Jezebel's particular family. It's not spiritually safe. You know, for him, but he, he was sent to this widow for, for, this, for this particular time. And I just want to remind you, sometimes God's plan and the hardships that I face are not about me. It is about reaching others. It's about me reaching others. Listen to me. There are good people in tough places who God wants to save. There are good people in tough places that God wants to save. And the only way to do that is to take one of you or me and place us in a difficult environment for God's glory. Right? Now listen, when he puts us there, and I talked about it 
just a little bit last week, when he talks, when he puts us in tough places, he needs us to be tough people as well. We pray for deliverance. We don't, we don't want to be, you know, we don't want to be mistreated. We don't want anything that's adverse in, in our life. But when he places us there, he places us there because there's good people there. And the light of the gospel needs to be, you know, needs to be dispensed there. So he needs us to be tough. The ability to bend and not break in adversity. Unwillingness to give up under hardship. Endurance and perseverance in hard or stressful times. He, uh, Paul says to Timothy, endure hard times like a good soldier. Any military folks out here? Remember basic training? That was a joy, wasn't it? That was a joy. But they... they they give you a hard time initially because they know, man, later on you could be faced with much worse and they're trying to prepare you for that. So when he puts us in tough places, he doesn't always need for us to pray for deliverance. There are times that he, we need to have the realization that, hey, I may not understand it, but God has me here for a purpose. And if I'm here for this purpose in this particular time, then God use me any way that you can. you got to be tough. you got to be tough. We, 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 with endurance and perseverance and unwillingness to give up under hardship. Any uh, Survivor fans out there? Any Survivor fans? I have watched it since it came on. I love Survivor, okay? I love it and watched almost every season. And they do different challenges or immunities to kind of separate the crowd. Sometimes they do food. You know, we have to eat strange foods. You know, now, now that would, I'd be out. I wouldn't eat anything strange. I'll just go ahead and wave the white flag, okay? I'm done. But from time to time, they do different endurance challenges. One of my favorite was the totem pole challenge. We have a little image up here. Uh, there you go. So all of the people of Survivor, they were, <clears throat> you had to stand on that pole, and whoever was last won the challenge or won the immunity. So they put all, I think it was 14, 15 out there, standing on the pole. You fall in the water, you're over. If you stand, you can win. So one hour went by. Two hours went by. Four hours went by. Six hours standing on the pole. Didn't move. Now, some of them fell off. Eight hours standing on the pole. Nine hours. Ten hours. Eleven hours standing on the pole. Eleven and a half hours. Finally, there was a winner. Okay? Eleven and a half hours. Now, listen. That's not, you know, I mean, that, 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 that's difficult environment. But sometimes you just got to get it in your head that even though, man, I'm, I'm going through a, a difficult time, I'm not, I'm not giving up. That's what the word perseverance is about. He puts us in tough places, puts us in difficult situations, and he needs us for that season just to be tough. And go, man, if I could change this, I would do it. But unfortunately, this door's not opening right now. So until God opens another door, I'm just going to tough it out and let God use me. There's a, there's a, we, we, we've got to, you know, got to be tough in our character. Now listen, we've heard the, we've heard the scripture, light of the world. Light of the world, okay? We want to be the light of the world. But light is only really effective in dark places, in difficult places, that's, that's where light is most effective. Light in another lit room, it's not really that impactful. So God puts light in darkness sometimes for that particular light to shine. He puts us there so that we can model and share our story of God's goodness. He puts, he puts Elijah, he puts him inside him. God puts godly people in tough places to work for his glory. He puts Joseph in Potiphar's house. He puts Daniel in Nehemiah's kingdom. He puts uh, in Philippians. He puts saints in, in Caesar's house. There are times that God puts godly people in difficult places to work for his glory. Okay? So what, he's, what's, what, what am I doing inside? And I'm the prophet. I did something great. Alright? But our challenge is to intentionally build authentic friendships with people who are not believers. So, listen. So you've prayed, Lord, move me, deliver me, 
you know, change, change this situation and it hadn't happened, okay, then at some point you got to assume God's got you there for a purpose. God has you there for a reason. And if that's, if that's God's plan for you in this season, then let's shine God's light where we're at. Let's build friendships. Let's build relationships. Let's let God use us wherever, you know, wherever we are at. First Peter says this. Live such good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Look at that. Live good lives among the pagans. All right? People that have a completely different religious view, different kind of lifestyle, different kind of value system and structure. He said, live good lives among the pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. Okay? All right. Go to, go to chapter 18. Let's kind of pick up the, the widow has got her son back. Everybody's happy. Verse, or chapter 18. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab summoned Obadiah, his palace administrator. And Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each. And he had supplied them with food and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, go through all the land to all the springs in the valley. Maybe, maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in the other. So now the Lord says, okay, it's time for you to go, go back and see Abraham or, or uh, Ahab. That'd be a whole different story if he saw Abraham, right? I'd really have to be creative on this, so... It's year three of the drought. Not one drop of rain. He's coming back from Sidon to Samaria, the capital of Israel. It's about a hundred mile walk. Okay, It's got to be a very difficult walk personally. But also he's seeing the effects of three years of drought. Dry riverbeds, dry brooks, uh, uh, dead carcasses of, of, of animals, dried up fields. He's seeing the, the impact of the drought. Even to the point, even, uh, Elijah didn't see this, but Ahab is very worried about the drought. He's worried about losing his horses and his mules because if you were a king, man, how you got troops around and how you got supplies around was based on those animals. So he's starting to get a little nervous as well, okay? And we're going to talk about Ahab in just a moment. But there's another sentence there that that got my attention that I just want to bring out. It says, Jezebel was killing the prophets of God. In the midst of this entire situation here, Jezebel was killing off off the Lord's prophets. So, um, and, and it was part of Baal worship. You couldn't have any other you know, religious system, and it was a, a search and destroy, religious cleansing. She's killing off the prophets. It's muting the message of God because the prophets can't, you know, the prophets can't speak. They're being killed. And also with this, and you'll see later on in this, in this story, it brought fear and intimidation upon those that were, um, upon those that were serving God. Okay, so there was this, intentional, you know, cleansing of, of anything that had to do with worship of Jehovah. And I just want to take a moment, I just want to talk about that because I, I see some of the same things that are occurring in our, in, our, in our government, in our media, in our culture, in our history. We see this, this intentional cleansing of, of anything that has to do with God, relationship with God, Jesus righteousness, holiness, anything like that. We just see this intentional kind of cleansing that has happened. And if you believe anything different 
than what the, the secularists say, then you are, you know, you are, 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 are labeled, you know, filled with hate speech or intolerant or bigoted or anti this and anti that. And I want to say too, one of the worst things that you can be, you know, uh, uh, labeled today is intolerant. That's just terrible. If you're, if they, if someone doesn't agree or, you, or agree with your stand on anything, you are, you know, you are intolerant because the definition of tolerance today is you must approve what I do, and you cannot oppose what I do. You must approve what I'm doing, and you cannot oppose what I'm doing. And if you violate either one of those, you are labeled intolerant. And I want to tell you, I think today that they don't care really what goes on in the walls of this church during church service or our small groups. They don't care what we say to each other, but they want to keep us quiet in the public arena. They don't want us to say anything. They don't want us to, to, you know, to, to say anything outside of you know, the political correctness that we see today. The New York Times un, even agreed you know, kind of with this thinking in an article called The Culture of Shame. It says, to talk of good and bad has to defer now to talk about respect and recognition. The talk of right and wrong is troubling when it's accompanied by the experience of shame that accompanies judgments of immorality. It says you can't have a discussion anymore about truth, you know, because we've got to respect and recognize and give recognition uh, of, 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 of anything that, you know, anything that we oppose. You've seen this on the news. You saw the Oregon baker several years ago. Melissa and Aaron Klein, they operated sweet cakes in Oregon. And they refused to make a cake to, for a, a same-sex wedding. And the people were offended, made a complaint to the Oregon Bureau of Labor and, and Industries claiming that their civil rights under the Oregon Equality Act had been, you know, had been violated. And I want to tell you something. Man, these people, they have been, they have... I mean, gone bankrupt. You know, just, they, they weren't rude to anyone. They served anyone that came in. But for this particular thing, they said, no, we can't do that. And the government wasn't private citizens. It was the government that started lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit. And these people, man, if, if they still have a dollar to their name, that would be good. But these people kept standing, you know, for what they felt like was right. And in June of this year, the Supreme Court just finally said to Oregon, take your hand off. These people were in their own rights to do this kind of thing. Now, I want to just say something to you. They are just trying to silence the church with intimidation. Okay, sometimes, you know, uh, through the, the threat of lawsuit or the threat of this, they're just trying to keep us silent. What we preach here, I don't think they really care what goes on at the, inside the walls of this church. But they are trying to keep and intimidate us out of saying what we need to say in the public arena. And I just want to say something to you this morning. Ahab had boldness and he went and spoke to Ahab, Jezebel, she was doing what she could to, you know, to kind of cleanse. And I just want to say to you and I this morning that we, we, when it comes to biblical truth, that regardless of what the cost is, we need to stand up for the truth of God's Word. All right? We, they, we're... we're they, they try to intimidate us and scare us. You're going to lose this. It's going to cost. It's going to cost you this. And I just want to tell you, we all we never want to be rude. We never want to be ugly to anyone. But when it comes to standing up for God's truth, there is a point to where we cannot remain silent anymore. There is a point that we just can't do that. <clears throat> they told Peter and John, "You cannot preach anymore in the name of Jesus." They put him in jail for the gospel. And when they got out, here's your sentence. You can't preach anymore in the, in the name of Jesus. And they, they considered that after they were released from prison. And they, walked, they, they went and they prayed this prayer with the church. Now, Lord, consider their threats 
and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Okay? So they acknowledge the threats aren't going away. The environment is not going to change. There's not going to be a turnover in the spiritual landscape that I'm going to serve in. So if that's the case, then Lord, just give me boldness. Let me say what I need to say when I need to say it. And Lord, if there's some cost that I have to pay for that, then Lord, you'll reward me later down the road. I love that passage. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. So I just want to say, give us boldness like Elijah. Let us speak what we need to speak. Some of you, you work in, in, in environments where if, if bib, your, your view on biblical truth surfaced, you would lose your job. And I hate that for some of you, where you feel like you've got to be quiet. You cannot say what you would normally say. Everybody else is speaking what they speak, right? Nobody else is worried about what they say. How you, you know, you might be offended, but, but they, they, they've made it where we, can't even, where we can't even say anything. And I don't, I don't want you to go out and in, intentionally lose your job. But I'm just saying there's a point, there is a point where we make a stand for spiritual truth and biblical truth. And if there is a price that you pay in doing that, then God will reward you for that. Okay? We just can't be quiet about everything. I mean, at some point we've got we to gotta speak up. So... All right, so verse 7, Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him and bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my Lord? Yes, he replied. Go tell your master Elijah's here. What have I done wrong? That you are handing over your servant to Ahab to be put to death. Surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. Whenever a nation or kingdom claimed that you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. But now you, but now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. If I, if I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I have been your servant and have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each. I supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Elijah said, as the Almighty lives whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So, So we have a new person introduced in the story. And sometimes Ahab does not always get the credit, you know, uh, historical credit for being a great person of God. But you need to write this name down and remember this name and, and look at the role that he plays here. So what do we know about, what do we know about Obadiah? That he had served God since he was young. Since he was young. Can I just say to our, our students, young people, The best time to serve Jesus is right now. It's right now. Don't don't go, let me get out of college and let me have all my fun and then I'll serve God. Number one, that's not true, okay? If you think that nobody has any fun, you know, while they're college age, then you're wrong. But what I have seen is a lot of people mess mess their lives up in college. I have seen that. All right. So if you're young, the time is now. Give it all over to the Lord. Serve Jesus with all your heart. Don't wait till you get older. Do like Obadiah. Man, as early as you can, commit yourself to the Lord and serve the Lord. And I promise you this, you will never look back over your life when you're 50 years of age and go, you know what? Wow, I really wish I would have lived a different way in college. I promise you, you will thank God that His hand was upon your life in difficult years. So what do we know about Obadiah? He had served God since he was young. Serve God. Just don't go to church. Man, love Jesus and give your heart to Him and you'll never regret that. Obadiah was a a devout believer while working in the place of Ahab. Okay, Man, he's working in a really tenuous place. But he's a... He was a devout believer in the palace of Ahab. 
He had learned the trust, had earned the trust of Ahab. When they are, when, ah, when Ahab's trying to search, you know, for water, he takes the palace administrator with him. So he had worked, evidently, he had worked under this adverse circumstance for a long period of time. He had worked in Ahab's palace. He was a hard worker. He had proved himself to Ahab. And he was the palace administrator that gave him lots of latitude and lots of flexibility in his particular role. He earned the trust of Ahab. He was a person of passionate faith, hiding 100 prophets while Jezebel was killing them. Wow. All right. Now, where, where do you think he got the food to feed these extra hundred people during the drought? Where do you think he got that? Because he had been put in a place because of the favor of God, almost like Joseph, where he could take care of these prophets. Okay? He, he was, he, and he was passionate about his faith. He understood what would happen because he mentioned to Elijah several times, hey, they will, he'll kill me. He will kill me, but he, he leveraged the opportunity that he had and he let, God, he let God use him. He was a person of passionate faith. So, let's just, what, what, what can we see from this? Listen, you may be in a workplace, in a work environment that your, your boss is terrible, okay? Might be harsh, you know, bad language. You don't feel like it's a great you know, great work environment at all. You all, you know, you just always feel, you know, always feel a little nervous. He may be, or she, let's be equal opportunity here. He or she may be ungodly, harsh, and uncaring. It may be a dangerous place spiritually, you know, for, for you and the beliefs of your employer or, or the company may run counter to you know, to your particular beliefs. But I just want to say to you that there are times that God places you there. And you've prayed, you've prayed for a, a transfer. And it's not happening. Because God's using you there. God wants to use you there. Work, you know, serve God. Serve God there. Work hard and make an impact. It's what Obadiah did. Ahab just didn't turn bad overnight. He's a bad dude for a long time before Jezebel even came around. Obadiah knew, knew what was, was going on and he, he just worked faithfully. And I just want to tell you, if, if your boss is terrible and your work environment is horrible, that may be why God placed you there. That's a good amen point, but I knew I wouldn't get one. I knew. I see your prayer cards on Tuesday. Pray for a transfer. Pray for a new job. I'm just going to start writing, no, I'm not, and send it back to you. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Elijah, Elijah, and Obadiah. God needs two types of people. Two types of people. We see two different kind of roles in this passage. God needs two types of people. He needs Elijahs. He needs Elijahs. He needs the bold prophet, the miracle worker, the one that's tough, that can handle criticism and can handle hardship, the one that's kind of out in front. He's kind of confrontational and, 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 and willing to put aside personal comfort if needed for the, for the gospel. God needs those Elijah types. I pray God raises up more Elijahs that just serve God, that God can use and do miraculous works through that. And all that comes through being a prophet. We love the miracle, right? We love the miracle part, but we don't like sitting by the brook waiting on food from bread. All right? So God needs those types. I pray. God raise up a, a, another generation of modern days Elijahs that don't care about personal comfort or convenience, that just want to serve God and be used of God. We need Elijahs. And then we also need Obadiahs. We also need Obadiahs. We, he needs faithful, consistent, the faithful, consistent life and influence. 
We need those that, that go to work and they're faithful to their families and they serve God wherever they have the opportunity. Not everyone can be an Elijah, but everyone can be an Obadiah. Everyone can, can be that. But in the kingdom of God, you need both. You need both. You need someone with the boldness that will go, it's not going to rain until God tells me to tell you that it's going to rain. You need those. But then the, they also need the Obadiahs that have been faithful and they've got this plan because later on you're going to see the release of those hundred prophets and you're going to see the fruit of Obadiah's faithfulness and his ingenuity and how, and how God used him. Can I tell you this morning, if you're a businessman, don't think that the only ministry of the gospel comes from this pulpit on Sunday morning. If you're a teacher, if you're, in the, if you're a, a medical professional, if you're a stay-at-home parent, don't think that the only gospel ministry that's ever done is from the pulpit or from the Elijahs in the church because it's not. It's not because God's greatest works are done through faithful servants in everyday places. Amen. God's greatest works are done through faithful servants in everyday places. So when you get up, that's your mission field. That's your place. That's your church. That's what you pastor. That's the realm of influence that God has given you. Some of you, you work with, with other believers, and it's just a great environment. You, you encourage each other. You support each other. It, you know, it, it's great. Some of you have just the opposite. It's darkness from, from, day, from, you know, from the beginning. It's profanity. It's, it's all talk of other things. Sometimes you just want to kind of take a bath when you, when you go home, you know? But it doesn't matter because God's using you there. God's using you there. there may, that may just be for a season that he opens something else up for you. But right now, don't curse it and try to leave. Try to impact it the best you can. The best you can. God's greatest works are done through faithful servants in everyday places. Last part, Elijah confronts Ahab. So Ahab went to meet, Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, uh, and told Ahab, let me try to do that sentence again. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, the troubler of Israel? And Elijah replies, I've not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed Baals. Okay? I mean, just a very clear and bold statement. Okay? Now, let, let's just take a moment. I'm going to close. And let's look at how God uses different ways to bring us to himself. Okay? Because we can learn something from this passage. So different ways that God brings us to himself, okay? So the first is like the initial gospel presentation. Maybe the first time, second, third time that you've ever heard the gospel. I mean, really, and something just in your heart leapt when you heard the good news. Sometimes, you know, in kids' church, man, they respond to the altar, you know, 35 times. But you know... If it's a good deal last week and if it's a good deal this week, I'm going to respond to it again. I don't care because it's such a, it's such a good thing. Some of you when, you, when you come out of darkness, maybe you're, you weren't raised in church, but when you come out of darkness and you hear the wonderful message of, 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 of the gospel, man, there's just this immediate response. Second Corinthians says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So sometimes just with the initial hearing, there's something that just leaps in your heart and just goes, wow, I want that. I want that. So there's the initial gospel presentation. Okay? Some people respond to that. Then there's the other. We hear it, but we don't respond to it. And then 
the Lord starts coming after us. He starts chasing us. Why does he do that? Because he loves us. He loves us. So we hear, and for whatever reason, we walk away. We go, you know, do, do different, you know, do different things. And it's the Lord who's chasing us. He's coming after us. So maybe some of you, you'll, you'll know what it's like. Maybe when you're sitting in church and the pastor's giving the altar call. And man, you feel on the inside, you just feel something going on in your heart. Do you know that's the Holy Spirit? That's the, the Lord going, hey, I'm still here. He's coming after us. He's chasing after us. He's doing what he can. He's going, listen, look at my love. Look at my grace. Look at eternal life. This is a great deal for you. Plus, I just want to fellowship with you and know you in a greater way. Jesus talked about a, a, a shepherd. And he had a hundred sheep. And those sheep, this isn't a petting zoo here. This is the family business. You got wool, you got milk, you got cheese. You could sell it off for meat if you wanted. I mean, a hundred sheep. And one of them left. And and this shepherd made a very poor business decision that he left the 99 to go get one. He could have been fired. He came, comes back and they're scattered or there's wolves. But it shows us one thing, the love and the value that, that God places on us. That's why sometimes you're out on the weekend and you're doing something that you shouldn't. But on the inside of your heart, there's just this uncomfortable feeling going, why am I thinking about church? Why am I thinking about Jesus? Because he's chasing you down. Jesus said when that shepherd found that sheep, he was so happy. He was so happy because of the value of the one. Worship team, you guys can come. Then there's another part and how we come to God. There's the, just the initial presentation. There's the point where we may not accept it at first, but then the Lord comes after us. But then... We start walking through hard times of our own choosing, okay? All right? Can I tell you it was never God's will for Ahab and Israel to go through this drought? But there are some times that the Lord will go, you know what? You want to walk that way? I'm going to let you walk that way, okay? I'm going to let you... Eat of the fruit of your own choices. Okay? So sometimes we're going through hard seasons. Hard times. Now this isn't for everyone this morning. What I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not saying every one of you that are going through a hard time this morning, it's some kind of chastisement from the Lord. I'm not saying that. But some of you it may be. Some of you got stuff going on in your life and you're going, what's happening? Why is this here? Why is this here? And here's what's happened. You've said to the Lord over a period of time, you know what? I got this. And He lets you take off. And then all of a sudden, there's difficulty and hard times and hardships that are, that are coming up in, in your life and you don't understand that. What's going on? I'm just telling you. Sometimes the Lord knows how to kind of turn the screws on our life. Not to punish you, but to get you to turn back to God. That's what He wants. That's what He wants. Hard times come to bring us to correction and to get us to turn to God. Some of you are going through a tough time. I'm saying it's, this isn't for everyone this morning. These are, I'm just saying, some of you are just walked in a way intentionally and you got yourself in a mess and God's letting you stay there not to punish you or that he can wave his finger at you 
but that he can get your attention because he's tried the message of love and grace and, 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 and eternity in heaven and you haven't responded to that. So now it's just the next level. It's just the next level that he lets us go through difficult times so that we'll turn to Jesus. That we'll turn, that's it, that's it. Hard times come to bring us to correction and to get us to turn, get us to turn to God. God does not want judgment. He wants you to come to Him in repentance and for fellowship. He's not here just to beat you down. He's he's here to go, hey, I'm here. I'm here. So there was a young guy in the Bible, left home, walked away, started living his own life. Started doing his own thing. His father had taught him differently. Did his own thing, walked away, no money, living, living in, in abject poverty. All right. The father never went and removed him. He didn't go say, come on out. The father just let him stay. Just let him stay. And eventually, it got so difficult, the guy said, I want to go back. I want to turn. And when he did, he started coming back to the father's house all nasty, physically nasty, broke, screwed up his life. The father sees him and takes off running because God's not about judging you. It's not a, you're, some of you are going through a hard time because you've made choices away from God. This is the moment here this morning that you go, you know what, I don't have to live this way or do this I can turn to God and today's your day to do that we see that Ahab it it was not God's will for the the hardship to come what did what did Elijah say hey when when he said Ahab said you're the troubler he said no it's not me I haven't made trouble for Israel it's you and it's your family that have abandoned the Lord's commandments and they followed Baal so I just want to go the hardship you're in. It's not about Jesus this morning. That's your choice. But this morning, he says, you don't have to live under that hardship. I'm not all about judgment this morning. I'm about saying, come home. Come home. Come home. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning.
Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor at Generations Church. Thank you for watching our service. If you're a guest, please fill out the contact information at gctlh.org forward slash connect. Please know it's our desire to provide ministry to every age, starting at GC Kids Junior, our nursery program, all the way through our senior adults that we call teenagers. We also have many ways that you can be involved at Generations Church, one of which is our small groups that we call connect groups, or you can find your place of ministry in one of our serve teams. Please know that we appreciate you watching, and we hope to see you in one of our services very soon. If you have any questions about our church or want to respond in any way to the service, please feel free to message us at info at gctlh.org. God bless you, and thank you for watching.